As I indicated to you today, we're going to be introducing uh, Plato. He is not only the only source we have for the life of Socrates, but he is himself, some people would say, the most important philosopher in the history of the planet Earth. So for example, how many know the name Alfred North Whitehead? You ever heard of him? He's a famous guy, Englishman. All right. He's a, he's a big deal guy. All right. Just take my word for it. He says this famous quote. Alfred North Whitehead says, you don't have to take this down. Just get the spirit of the statement. Quote, the safest general characterization of the European philosophical tradition is that it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato. There's a lot of different ways to try to start dealing with Plato, but my favorite is to simply begin by showing you two great works of art from the Western world. This is one of them. Hope you all recognize this one. You've seen that. Matthew, do you recognize that particular uh, painting? I know you're kind of a bad angle here, but do you recognize that? That would be the Mona Lisa, painted, of course, by who? Kaylee? Da Vinci, Leonardo da Vinci. So you've got that great piece of art, and then there's one other I'm sure you'll all recognize. It's, uh, and I want you to kind of compare and contrast them. And this is how we're going to start. This one was called the Betty Sue. took that photo in the Uffizi. I'm sure you all caught it when you were touring there. The Betty Sue. Painted, of course, by that world-renowned artist, Gore. Da Vinci, Gore. Now, sometimes when I've asked this question, I've gotten smart aleck answers. So I'm going to call on somebody who I know will play ball with me. She's not going to be what we call in the, in the biz cute, you know. So now, Sarah, I just want you to, I just want you to tell me as you examine these two pieces of very famous art that uh, obviously you've seen both of them many times in your life, and I want you to make now a judgment about which one is the more beautiful. Mona Lisa is more beautiful. You, you stab me to the core. <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> I thought of all people. Sarah would come through for me. Well, you have to admit, at least, it's kind of a close call, isn't it? I mean, you have to, it's not even a close call. Well, was anyone going to argue for the other team? Any, I mean, the, you've got a lot of ego at stake here. You know, is anybody going to take up the cause for the Betty Sue? Thank you. All right. I'm thinking, I, I, I will reconsider question one on your quiz here. Uh, Jordan, please. What, what, go ahead, make the case. Oh. I want you to tell me why the Betty Sue is more beautiful than the Mona Lisa. Well, the Mona Lisa, everyone, everyone has seen the Mona Lisa. It's, you know, it's old news. It's, it's <laughs> Mr. Gore's um, Betty Sue is original. It's, it's new. It's, it's, the, it's modern art, as it were. I like this guy. It's the top of the modern art. Okay. And, <laughs> Who cares? I never met the guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. So Jordan, Jordan has made, I think, a compelling case, one that I find highly persuasive personally. Does that modify anybody's view? Is anyone going to change their vote here? Change. Oh, all right, Matthew. Joe, I've changed your. Or, uh, Jordan changed your view, did he? Well, I'm just saying that that issue might have. 
personal, like at my hold some personal beauty for the person you screwed up. Like you're not that for your daughter. <laughs> Yeah. And also, the Mona Lisa, I want to see it, and it's really not that impressive. It's like <laughs> close to actual size right there. And it's behind this big thing, and it's um, disappointing. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> all right. Well, now, here's what I want you to consider. You know, uh, there's been some degree of uh, controversy in recent years about the National Endowment for the Arts, for example, in America, where tax money goes to sponsor different artists who produce different kinds of art. And uh, the question has come up. I mean, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with this. One of the more famous uh, illustrations of what was called art was a crucifix uh, in a beaker of urine. Remember that? Anybody come across that? Another one was a picture of the Virgin Mary with elephant dung smeared all over it. And of course people, and, and others, and your tax money was going to sponsor that kind of artistic expression. And not surprisingly, some people in the country were saying, whoa, what is this? You know, this doesn't seem like a legitimate use of tax money for what I don't think constitutes art. And that raised the whole question of what is art and what is beauty. And you had a lot of people arguing, hey, you have your view of beauty, I have mine. And it would be kind of like, I mean, I don't know how sincere Jordan was. I think he's a person of rare artistic insight. So maybe he, was, he really did realize that here there is greater beauty than here. But Jordan, as much of a genius as you are, you didn't win the day. And I hate to say it because, of course, my own ego is very much injured by this. I think most people would say, well, it's really the Mona Lisa. But why? Why not? Why can't it be the Betty Sue? Who's to say, in other words, that it's one or the other? We all kind of have an instinct. But the fact of the matter is, a lot of people would run around and say, well, hey, if, you know, if Trevor here thinks the Betty Sue is the more beautiful, then, hey, the Betty Sue is the more beautiful for Trevor. And there's no other place to go to settle the case, except maybe just counting noses, take a vote. Are you all familiar with that? You all kind of feel that that's part of your culture. It's the whole controversy about what is good, what is true, what's beautiful. Who's to say? And there's a very strong kind of attitude in your culture that, well, if it, if it works for you, you know, then it's okay for you. It's your truth. It's your beauty. And so on. All right. Well, we will now retire. Of course, I have to turn these back over to the curator to protect them until I use them again next year. So we'll keep them safe here. If any of you want to take a closer look at, you know, I mean. Plato comes along and he is the first great philosopher in history to say there is a difference between the Mona Lisa and the Betty Sue. And as a matter of fact, not just opinion, fact, the Mona Lisa is more, more beautiful. It is not simply a matter of personal opinion. Plato argues for the idea that there is an objective standard of truth and an objective standard of beauty and an objective standard of goodness and even if you don't like it, it's not going to change it. You didn't put it there and you can't take it away. It is objectively true, not simply subjectively true. So Plato's the great objectivist. Uh, in history. Does what I just said make sense? Do you all get the point of that so far? Mr. Cheeley, please. What 
does he use to measure? That, my son, is exactly where we want to proceed. So hold that. Any other comment about just the general proposition? It's the basic proposition I want you to get. There is objective truth, beauty, goodness. Where it is, how we discover it, Avery, we'll have to work our way through that a little bit. All right. Um, to understand Plato, we have to go back and remember that there were the Ionians and the Italians. So that was the raging debate in the philosophy up until this point. And the most important guy representing the Ionians was a character by the name of Nicole, the most important Ionian. Uh, no, he's the first. Not the most important. The most important is Sidney Heraclitus. And the most important Italian was Stephen. Was it Pythagoras? Pythagoras was one of them, but not the most important. It was Kayla? Parmenides. Parmenides, thank you. Now, I want you to know that. I want you to know that the, the Ionians, more or less the, the heart of the matter was captured by Heraclitus. And the heart of the matter was captured in Italy by Parmenides. I want you to know those other guys as well. But you should realize these are the two that brought the debate to its most acute level. Parmenides stands for the idea that, what would be the little catchphrase that would more or less capture the uh, insights of Parmenides, Sarah, that's right. Ultimate being, whatever is, is. Change is illusory. Something is fixed and permanent and eternal. It is unchanging. It is being. If you think about it, whatever being is, however you conceive of it, you realize that whatever it is, it cannot change. It is being. It doesn't get old. In a sense, it has no beginning or end. It's, it's, not, it's not becoming anything. It is just being, you know. And that's what uh, Parmenides wants to argue is rationally necessary based on just the use of the mind. Heraclitus, of course, stands for just the opposite idea. Everything's becoming. So you might say, on the one hand, Parmenides is the great champion of being. Heraclitus is the great champion of becoming. Parmenides stands for the idea that everything stays permanently as it is. Heraclitus stands for the idea that everything is in flux. You never step into the same river twice. You know, tick, 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 tick. You're getting older. Time is slipping through your fingers. All right. Two other words that I want to now tie to these two. And, and I, we will come back to these countless times. I mean countless times through this course. So this is my first introduction of these terms. Please try to get it right now. It'll help because I won't have to re-explain it 10,000 times as we go along. Heraclitus is the great champion of philosophical empiricism. Parmenides is the great champion of philosophical what? What would be the opposite here of empiricism, do you suppose? Any idea? Trevor, do you have any idea? The opposite of empiricism would be? No, I'd, anybody want to take a stab at that? Josiah? Rash. Rash. Go ahead, say the whole word. It's rational. Rationalism. What is empiricism? What does that word mean? Sydney, what is empiricism? Um, these ideas that you learn through experience. 
yes. You learn through experience generally, or the word we'd use a little more precise, you learn through, when we say through experience, we're really saying you learn through what exactly? You know what I'm after, anybody? You learn through, Avery? Error? Not exactly. If you learn through experience, okay, get, this is the word I'm after, you learn through your senses. You learn through sensation. Not in the sense of something being sensational, like a great movie, but sensation means your senses. You experience it through primarily your five senses. You know. The rationalists, on the other hand, say you learn primarily through the operation of the mind. The mind precedes sensation. So it's two different emphases. Heraclitus looks at the world, he sees it's changing, and that becomes the way that he understands truth. His senses tell him everything's changing, right? That's his sensory experience. I have it every day. I walk into this classroom, you all look one day older. You're aging. That's what my senses tell me. Parmenides, on the other hand, would look at you, and even though he would see what he calls an illusion of change, he knows that fundamentally nothing is changing. That's what his mind demands. That's what Zeno's paradox has proved. And so that's what he accepts must be the truth of the matter. Got that? Well, here's a big impasse. These two guys are locked in this combat. Nobody can resolve it. And for a while, what you get in Greece is a period of skepticism. And that's who the sophists are. We talked about them. The sophists are skeptical. They say, we don't know who's right. Parmenides sounds right. Heraclitus sounds right. Can't figure it out. They both sound right. So the sophists say, who cares anyway? You know? Let's just, let's just get busy about more important things like making money, having a good job, getting elected mayor, you know, stuff like that, stuff that really matters. And uh, so you have this kind of malaise until along comes a guy named Plato. And Plato now becomes the great synthesizer. He wants to take the insights of Parmenides and the insights of Heraclitus and sync them up into a new philosophy called Platonism. And uh, thus is born one of the most important moments in philosophical history. All right. Just a tiny little bit of biographical stuff on Plato. It's not, the life of Plato is not that important, but it helps to know a little bit about him. So, Plato was born in an aristocratic family in uh, Athens. His real name was Aristocles. A-R-I-S-T-O-C-L-E-S, -E Aristocles. He was a wrestler. And he was a big guy, and he picked up the nickname as a wrestler, Plato, Platon, which means something like broad-shouldered or buff. So that's what the word actually means. He became a disciple of Socrates as a young man, was one of his groupies, followed him around Athens, loved to see Socrates giving a bad time to the political leaders in Athens. Plato was deeply, deeply negatively affected by the condemnation of Socrates. That was for him a life-changing event when Socrates was executed. Plato fell out of love with Athens. And he went on a long tour, 
and he toured all through the ancient world. We don't know if he ever made it to the region that we call Israel. Some people think he might have and actually come in contact with the Jewish religion. That's a wide open question, very speculative. I think the consensus is he did not. But he does seem to have made it to the east. He traveled all through Ionia and, of course, uh, Egypt and so on. So about 10 years, he does what a lot of people would like to do, just go for a big trip, you know. Not two weeks, but 10 years. Can you imagine that? I mean, two weeks. Well, he had money. Yeah. yeah. And he had, you know, his American Express, so it was okay. Yeah, get you anywhere. So anyway, he, uh, he travels around for about 10 years, comes back to Athens in the year 387. So remember, Socrates was executed in what year? Ben? 399. 399, a date you'll never forget. He's gone about 10 years, comes back in 387, and um, he'd been especially influenced by the Pythagoreans. He'd been especially influenced by the Ionians. And uh, I'm sorry, by the Italians, I should say, by this uh, uh, kind of um, uh, philosophical outlook. But he'd also been touched by these guys. And his great quest was, how can I put this together? How can we take the contribution both of Parmenides and of Heraclitus and the others who have commented and come up with some new grand you know, philosophical scheme that will do justice to uh, both of them? So that's what Plato's trying to do. He founds in Athens, a little school, hangs out a shingle, and says, you pay me money, I will teach you philosophy. The name of the school was? What is the name of the school? Do you know, Megan? It's called? The Academia. Okay, that's right, or just the Academy. Does anyone know how the academy got its name? Where that word came from? Anybody know? Well, he opened his school originally in a, in a little region that was kind of a grove of trees. He taught outside, uh, and it was lovely. And there was this grove of trees owned by a guy named uh, something like Achimedes or something like that. So he just named his school after the guy that owned the grove of trees where he taught. So there you are. And we've had the word academy <clears throat> right down to the present day. The word has stuck. All right. He lived for another, you know, what, 40 years or so, died at about 80 years old. Uh, his most famous student was who? Who's the most famous student of Plato? Guy by the name of Jordan. Aristotle, Aristotle who we will move to next. But that won't be for a week or so. All right, let me give you, uh, in the time that we have left, um, what, are called, what I had presented to me once is the seven beliefs that Plato opposed. Uh, so these were kind of commonly floating around the uh, philosophical world of the time, and Plato is hostile to all of these ideas. He is hostile to atheism. Atheism is, Spencer, atheism is what? Uh, atheism is the belief that no God exists. That's right, that there is no God, that there is no transcendent order, that there is nothing above this world, and have we studied any atheists so far in our examination of the pre-Socratics? Have there been any atheists we've looked at? The answer is... <laughs> I'm seeing a mixed response here. Any atheists? Mr. Culberson, have we uh, examined any atheists along the way in our little survey of the pre-Socratics? All right, they probably were. 
We also have the, the go ahead, Matthew. That's right. Remember the four characteristics of the Ionians? Every one of those would be atheistic in character. Naturalists, materialists, right? All of that. The Ionians were corporeal monists. If you're a corporeal monist, you are generally an atheist. Okay? And so, uh, in a sense, you would say that Plato is most hostile to the, uh, what, the Ionians, because he is hostile to the idea that there is such, such a thing as atheism. He believes there is a transcendent order, a supernatural order, and that that is necessary to make sense out of this world. So that's the first thing. Second thing he opposes is empiricism. Now we've used the word twice. So, Nicole, if I asked you what is empiricism, by now you've got it ingrained in your brain that empiricism is. The beliefs that you learn through your senses. Exactly. So, what uh, discipline generally would we associate with empiricism? If I said, go to the class which is most oriented to empirical investigation, you would immediately go to whose classroom? Every day of the week, it would be what class? Who's the most famous empiricist on the faculty? Just that science teachers are Mr. Dykstra. Mr. Dykstra, absolutely. I give him a bad time about that all the time. You see. Kind of an inside thing there. Plato doesn't believe that that's the true source of, you know, really reliable content about what is true and reliable. He believes that we have to look into the mind more than we look to the senses. But he doesn't discount the senses entirely, just kind of de-emphasizes them. Third thing he's hostile to is relativism. Alicia, what is relativism? Um, I don't you don't? Did you say you think you do or don't think you do? You don't think you know? Oh, come on. You guys got to know what relativism is. What is relativism? Joe, what is relativism? What is it? It is. is so what does that mean to say everything is relative? So everything depends on what you believe or I don't know how to say that. Okay, that's the idea. Relativism would be, Sarah, give me a one sentence definition of relativism. Whatever you believe is what you believe is you Okay, that's the idea. Well, you're kind of getting at it. You know, relativism is there's no fixed truth, no absolute truth. You ever heard of the expression, there are no absolutes? That would be relativism. I always like to hear that. Somebody says to me, there are no absolutes. How do I respond? Then what's that? Is that what you said? That's right. Do you mean that absolutely? <laughs> you know, <laughs> There are absolutely no absolutes? Or there's just relatively no absolutes? Which one is it? You know? Because if you're meaning it absolutely, the way you just said it, then there's at least one absolute, isn't it? Namely, that there are no absolutes, and you just defeated your own case, didn't you, right? But, uh, you know, relativism is self-refuting. On its face, it is absurd, but the general, usually the relatives doesn't care. They know they're being absurd. They like it that way. You know, we live in a very relativistic culture. I think you probably know that. Plato, however, is hostile to relativism. He believes there is fixed and absolute truth. And it's true whether you like it or not. The Mona Lisa is more beautiful than the Betty Sue, whether you like it or not. He doesn't care about my ego. He doesn't care about who votes for which. He doesn't care about you know, popularity. He says there's something that is true, and it's true regardless of our opinions about it. Sounds a little bit like Paul in Romans chapter 3, let God be true even if every man is a what? You know that verse? A liar. You know. 
so Plato is a uh, hostile to relativism. He's hostile to hedonism. Kayla, do you know the word hedonism? Ever heard that word? Okay, that's fine. Spencer, hedonism? I think hedonism is just seeking the highest pleasure. The pleasure is all that matters. Okay, something like that. But the most important thing in life is simply to seek pleasure. That's usually the philosophical outlook of the average male college freshman. So off you go to Pagan U, you're going to find yourself surrounded by a good working expression of hedonism. Usually by the time these male freshmen became uh, sophomores, they have confronted the hedonistic paradox which is that the more you seek pleasure, the more eventually you will feel pain, you know, but that's a different problem. Anyway, Plato is all about a higher call in your life. There are more important things than simply seeking pleasure. He's not a, he doesn't dislike pleasure, pleasure's fine, but there's more important things. Uh, of the people we've studied so far, there was one who I specifically said was a hedonist. I kind of threw that out there in passing, I didn't know if anyone caught it, but I mentioned it. And the guy's name is? Krista? Democritus. Very good. Democritus, who was an atomist. The only thing that exists is just material. And the only meaning in life before you die and pass into oblivion is to get as much pleasure as you can. And so he was, a, he was consistent to his own philosophy. Um, so we looked at him. All right, next thing that uh, Plato is opposed to is uh, materialism. Mr. True, what is materialism? That's right. That's exactly right. The only thing that exists is matter. Plato believes that as a matter of rational necessity, there must be something besides matter. There's something else, some other reality besides just the material universe. He is opposed to, number six, naturalism. Some of these are terms we've already looked at. We looked at them in connection with the Ionians. But uh, Plato especially singles these out. So, Mr. Barrett, what is uh, naturalism once again? Just to remind ourselves of that. Uh, what is it? Naturalism is uh, basically just uh, natural causes but, um, That's right. Okay. What do you mean by that? By natural causes? Just um, random, uh, random causes. <laughs> Okay, well, I, I hesitate to use the word random, but you're on the right, that, that's the idea. That everything happens by virtue of uh, material, natural causes, that is, causes that you can measure. There's no unseen causes, no causes outside the world of what we commonly call nature. You know. Plato believes there are unseen causes. He believes in a supernatural order. He believes there's a level of reality that you cannot put in a test tube, centrifuge out, weigh and measure, something else. And that that's part of how we understand you know, the world in which we live. And the final one that he opposes is mechanism. Mechanism is pretty similar, but it sort of highlights a certain point. Stephen, what do you think? Mechanism. Well, it sounds like mechanical. It does, yes. And so what is a mechanical device? We call a mechanical device a machine, yes. And 
what is the what are the typical characteristics of a machine? It's controlled by something else. Well, it can be, certainly can be, but what's oh, the? That's right. You know, I know some of you wonder about this, but I'm going to say to you now as a matter of philosophical principle, your car does not have free will. I mean, I grant, sometimes I feel like my car has not only free will, but a very rebellious will, you know, but the fact of the matter is a machine doesn't think, doesn't have a soul, it just operates by strict mechanical cause and effect. And there were those who said, that's what you are. You are a machine. You are a robot. You are an automaton. You are just cranking along based on material forces. You have no will. You have no, you know, anything in you that we would call you distinctly, you know, personhood in, in the sense that we normally use that word. You're just kind of grinding along in a mechanical sort of way, kind of like a car or a computer program or some such thing. Plato was opposed to all of those, and I want you to be able to tell me those seven and tell me their definitions. I guarantee you I will ask you that question eventually, and it will be kind of a basis upon which we do some other things, so make sure you get this. Yes, Alicia. What was Plato's response to well, his response to all of these, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off. I, I haven't really given you Plato's response to any of them yet, except in a, in a... He certainly believed in soul. He believed that we have some kind of moral uh, responsibility for our actions. You know. Let me ask you this. From a Christian point of view, just assessing now these ideas that Plato opposes, does Plato sound like a friend or an enemy? of the Christian faith, from what you've seen right here. Kaylee? It seems like a Christian. He sure does, doesn't he? I don't think there's any thoughtful Christian who wouldn't concur on every one of these. And that's why many people read Plato and they're impressed with how Christian he sounds. And in fact, there were some you know, thinkers in the early years of the church's history that thought Plato must be sort of a proto-Christian. He couldn't have been a true Christian because Jesus hadn't been born yet. He's 400 years too soon. Some people thought maybe Plato in his travels made it to Israel. Maybe he had contact with Jewish rabbis. Maybe he even read some of the Old Testament scriptures. I think the arguments for that are pretty thin. I Personally, I believe that's probably not true, but I wouldn't discount it out of hand. He certainly never says anything like that. But you begin to look at his thought and you think to yourself, whoa, this guy really does sound like one of the good guys in history. But there are some risks in Platonism. And uh, if you look at the early centuries of the church's history, there was a kind of hybrid of the Christian faith and Platonism that generated a bunch of heresies. What do we call that fundamental hybrid in church history between the Christian faith on the one hand and Platonism on the other. It's kind of a, a sort of, a, there's a generic word you'd use that represented that little whole unholy alliance between Platonism and the Christian faith, and we call it, but you know the term I'm after? It's one you all know, and you have studied it at least to some degree down through the years, here and elsewhere probably, and it is the word, Sydney. It is Gnosticism. Thank you. So although we have a certain temptation, a kind of inclination to endorse Plato and say, wow, he's on our team, he's in our corner, one of the good guys, be careful. Don't go too far down that road, because the church tended to do that in its early centuries, and it generated a whole distortion of the Christian faith that to this day is still with us, and it's this Gnostic uh, you know, flavor that really tends to be kind of hostile to this world. It sort of views 
in a dualistic way, most important things is otherworldly, and it discounts the importance of this world. So just be careful of that. But in the greater scheme of things, Plato does come across as a fairly good guy. <laughs>